came back from Iceland end of January, so it's been kind of a run for a project at this point. But yeah. That's okay. Two mm. months to do it. It's not bad. I guess we okay. should introduce who we are. <laughs> <laughs> sure thing. Okay, well, this is our third one. Third podcast, official one so far. Third, number three. We've got Aaron Pollock on with us. The one and only, famous. Yes, he's quite famous. Famous. I haven't heard of him. Yeah, <laughs> I'm Bryce. It's Kent. Okay, well, I guess, uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about uh, what's going on with you. So yeah, you guys got back from Iceland. It's been a bit of a mad dash so far. Yeah, no. Uh, so Iceland was pretty cool. Um, I've never been. I've always wanted to go. Awesome landscape. Uh, the city of Reykjavik is really cool too. Uh, great urban atmosphere. Um, so it was a great destination for us to set up the uh, project on the harbor front. Or group set up the, mm -hmm. the project. So it's just based on harbor front development and make your own harbor is the title of it. And so we're looking at uh, different ways of developing it and engaging the larger scale on like a climate, uh, like a climate kind of theme. Right. Mm -hmm. He's been, been there a ton though too, hey? so he must have been a pretty good uh, just a guide for a trip. In yeah, terms I of think this is his like non non work things too. Yeah. You know, how long were you guys there for? Uh, ten days. That's not bad. The flight's six hours. Uh, about six and a half. That's not bad. It wasn't bad at all. On Iceland air, they have nice uh, <coughs> fake aurora borealis happening on the roof. The whole roof of changes color. The whole color. plane, the whole time. Yeah, the whole time, it's overnight, and you can't sleep because this <laughs> thing is going on. No, it's above. sweet. Yeah, for the first minute or two. But that's yeah. Annoying. So was it, it was like full spectrum color, just dancing down. Yeah, there. it was just like LED hidden like above the luggage yeah. thing or whatever, and it was just like dancing away above. The so it was like a screen. Microsoft screensaver. Basically, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. pretty funny. It was a whole screen, not just like strips of LEDs or something? No, no, it was just like a strip of LED on oh, top see. of it. The whole ceiling of the plane was just... Herb must have been pumped though, he probably was like, guys, <laughs> <laughs> the ceiling. No, we, we didn't go with him, he came later. Ah. Uh, so we had a day or two to ourselves before he showed up. So that yeah. detail is incorporated into your next project? Yeah. Yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, Everybody, you guys done. found a sample. Yeah. That's the company. Did you guys mostly stay in Reykjavik, or did yeah, you go around? Yeah, we stayed in Reykjavik um, for the whole ten days, and then three days we did like excursions outside the city, which was probably one of the best parts of the trip. Really? Seeing like the landscape, the natural kind of phenomenon that happens. Right. Out there. Um, Heard about some scuba diving. Uh, yeah, yeah, we went snorkeling. Yeah, and we took Herb too. That was pretty funny. Oh, it was your guy that someone else decided to go, or someone else found it, and then... Yeah, I found it before uh, before we left. Oh, crazy. That was my one thing I had to do. Oh, interesting. Time. And so it's cool, it's like snorkeling in between the continental divide of like the Eurasian and North American plate. That's yeah. just like a 60 foot mm -hmm. canyon of glacier water. It was clear, so you could see right to the bottom? Yeah. Did you guys, any of you guys try to dive down to the bottom? Uh, yeah, we tried, but like you're wearing these dry suits that are so buoyant. <laughs> yeah, basically. So you're just like trying to go down and it's like maybe you get to your feet and then that's it. Really? Yeah. But it was sealed around your neck and you just had like a... Yeah, it was like chokehold around Skin tight? Yeah, Did they tell you to bad. shave like your neck before you came? No, or was it that bad. tight it didn't matter? Yeah, it's that tight. You won't fit. No, no. <laughs> people don't fit. Yeah. Well, that's like the same like military gas mask. You can't have any oh, anything around your face. Is that why they have mutton chops? That's why they had the mustache. Oh, I see. And like, yeah, exactly, because then you can still wear a gas mask. The history of the facial hair. That's cool. So then, what? How long were you in the water for? Did you just go? It was like a big. It was like a thirty-minute kind of. Was it guided? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow! It was like the guide, and I think there was eight of us following him, and he just kind of led you along, and then turned off into like this lagoon area and that's where you got off and everything. It was pretty cool, like they had all the infrastructure set into these things, like the the walkways or the great plank in the water that Free you to stand, stand on and then you get to take off your fins and all that stuff and then head on out. Because otherwise you'd just be floating, you float in the suit itself, so there's no struggle to keep above water. You just no, kind of... the only, the hardest part was that first like finding your buoyancy because like you get in and all of a sudden you're doing like <laughs> Oh man, that sounds really good. What uh, was there? There's no active, like, earth under that where you're scuba diving though, or you're snorkeling. Is there? It's all static, just the actual cavern itself. Um, 
I mean, Iceland itself gets earthquakes like nonstop. Did you feel any? No, unfortunately not. Um, it's mostly around like the central area of the island and actually in the southern area of the island too. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not huge earthquakes, and then we're talking like maybe one, two magnitudes. They're just like little... Like little tremors, if anything, but yeah, there's a, there's a website actually that shows you daily the different locations of these earthquakes, and they're all over the island on a regular basis. That's really neat. But no, really? unfortunately, I was hoping, I was really hoping while we were in there for like some tremors or something. Crazy yeah. Like that. I can't I imagine that. I don't think I've ever been in one. No, I've never hmm. experienced one. Are they anticipating a big one or anything? Kind of like the West Coast is uh, anticipating a, a big one coming up? Not that I know of. I mean, I'm sure there's always like a looming, right? With the, the one in 2008. Yeah. Um, e, I'll just call it. Mm -hmm. um, that one was a pretty big one, but I don't know if there's a huge earthquake associated with it or not. You go to any other natural events when you're there? Yeah, we went to um, Vik, which is on the southern end of the continent, or the country, sorry. And that's where they, they had the black sand beaches and things like that. And then we started continuing on in the, uh, along the Golden Circle, just kind of seeing the um, lava fields. Mm -hmm. Just all black and barren. Nothing. Did you guys stop and go touch them and walk on them and stuff? Or What's that? The lava fields and the beaches. Uh, well, it was all covered in snow. So oh. Like, Trust me, <laughs> there is this yeah, under the snow. <laughs> yeah. It's there, don't but worry. You can see like these weird rock forms everywhere. Um, there's that, a lot of that like near the Blue Lagoon, mm. the thermal pool we went to. Um, is it hot? No, no, it wasn't that bad. Like it's cooler than a hot tub here. Really? Yeah, but it, like it's just warm enough. Do not be cold outside. Yeah. Oh, um, what else did we see? We saw the uh, geyser and stroker, and then we saw the Gulf of Falls. And then there's another falls that we went to. Like there's a bunch of natural yeah. things that are kind of occurring out there that you can just drive around the Golden Circle and check out. Was cool. What was the uh, the kind of architecture you noticed out there? Was it similar to the ones you find in Canada, or is it no, it's, it's very own European. style? European. Yeah, like uh, a lot of the older buildings. It's, you feel like you're in Europe. Really? I mean, it's it, it's adopted a lot of European things. It's the European plugs. Yeah. Like, um, it, it's very closely associated kind of with the other northern countries. Was the urban development built the same way as Europe, or is based around walking more than is driving? Oh, yeah, totally, yeah. Everything is walking-based. But I think um, I was talking to one architect there, and they were saying they're having a difficulty now with like the North American idea of sprawl. And you really see that when you get on the bus and start going outside the city. Mm -hmm. um, just how much Reykjavik is starting to expand and you have like, I mean, there's still condos, they're not like our self-developments here. Mm -hmm. It's just a bunch of ugly houses and garages, but it's it's a lot more expanding out of the city, which mm -hmm. is kind of interesting. But um, no, yeah, it's a, it's a very dense kind of downtown, but it's not very big. Like we're talking the size of Brandon here. Oh, okay. Reykjavik? Yeah. Oh, crazy. I can't remember the population, but I think it's like a quarter of the island's population lives in Reykjavik. Wow. The whole island. So That's pretty intense. It's, yeah, it's not heavily populated. Right on. How are you going to incorporate your project? Or was your project was done prior to going on this trip? Uh, we did one project in the first term. Right. And that was based on the Great Plains and with the underlying theme of climate and weather. That's our studio name, Heavy Weather. Mm. Um, and then this term, it's associated to, again, Reykjavik and the harbor and um, trying to bring in climate in that discussion. So I'm talking mainly about um, digital media because music and projections and digital art forms are kind of a big thing there. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of like a new digital media center, something that they don't really have for like research and development and um, exhibitions and recording studios and things like that. We were kind of talking about that last time we talked about how you can change the physical form of architecture through media projection and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're trying to base it off of. and Kind of. Like I'm trying to not necessarily make a box for something to occur in it. Yeah. I'm just trying to make something that's like adaptable but then has its own language to itself. Right. Like it's hard to 
for every artist they want something different, right? But like, if you want to make a space that's adaptable for that, like, what do you make that mm -hmm. into? Like, or a projection, like, in that case, it could be a flat surface or it could be a moving surface. Like, I'm trying to think forward in terms of how digital media even would be used in such a situation. It's interesting because, say, for, uh, you say, I don't know about digital media artists, but then other, so tra traditional artists, you might think about setting up certain infrastructures and stuff so those people can be hanging their sculptures or whatever, and it might be about um, just sort of some kind of like physical scaffolds, for lack of a better, better word, mm -hmm. in that kind of condition. But then with digital media, I guess like what, what do those scaffolds look like in terms of systems, but then also then if it's only about uh, like a an like an electronic infrastructure that's not necessarily something that's architectural. So then, how do you manifest that architecturally? Is that that's what, what you're what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. <laughs> Is that yeah. just like an interest that you've had prior to um, prior to the studio? Um, not a huge dying interest in it, but like it was kind of an interesting thing about um, like this discussion of how digital media or urban media, how does that now interplay with an architecture or how can you make an architecture that houses it or vice versa, how, do you, how does media define an architecture? Hmm. Like it's, a, it's an interesting kind of topic because you're talking about media on all different scales like you know your phone, that's, that's your connection to everything else but then you get stuck in that world versus getting stuck in a different world of just being in the physical world. Like, there's that balance between the two. So that's always, I guess, kind of been interesting. I never really understood that connection until I got to Iceland and saw maybe how they could be kind of manifested into something. Hmm. Was that where you observed that? Was it a temporary thing that gets changed out every month or two months as like an art exhibition? Or is it more part of the building itself? For the building that I'm trying to do? Or the one you saw in Iceland? Um, it's, it's not necessarily like... Um, there's no spaces where something is always on display. Right. And we, when we were there, it was the Dark Days Music Festival, which is like, you know, due to the sun being so mm -hmm. low or whatever, they only get a certain amount of hours of daylight, and so they have this Dark Days Festival, and there's a lot of interesting things that go on with it, like in terms of food and culture and things like that, but they have this thing called Dark Days Music Festival, and it's focused mainly on, like, locally... Uh, made experimental music and um, projections and all sorts of things. So we went to a couple of different shows at the Harpa, which is like their new concert hall in the right. water. Um, but then we also went to something called Mangi, which is their... Uh, it's, it's more of like a privatized space that people can just use. It's like open all the time as like kind of a gallery, but for the most part it's an empty space that for the most part, students used showcase all sorts of work. So like, when we were there, we made it to one show by the um, performing arts students, and there was things from um, dances, to poetry, to um, projections, and some sort of interactive thing, all just within this, within this space. And it was all students and some props and things like that, but like, it's kind of a hotbed for this experimentation in digital media and forms that kind of I guess art or forms, but also information. So, from those two things are kind of what I took from like that experimental nature. Yeah. And are trying to apply it into more of a home base or something like that. So it was a perfect example to based what you were so interested in for your project. Kinda, yeah. Like there, there are all little tidbits of things. Like the music hall is just a music hall in terms of it allows various venues, right? But mm -hmm. maybe it was more specific to that experimental nature. So trying to maybe even blend the two, not necessarily dominating the culture in the country or anything like that, but like as an important node or something like that. You figure that's what your program is going to turn into with this project you're doing right now? Um, it's going to be that, and then also integrating the site that I chose. I found out after the fact it's where smaller cruise ships dock. So it's in Iceland, the site? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's okay. right on the harbor front, and so I'm trying to integrate 
cruise ship docking with digital media, so bringing Sweet. that education and things together. That's neat, because you can change the building, the building could change dependent on what kind of cruise ship is docking or yeah, exactly. whatever it is, and it's never, I mean, physically it would be the same thing, but you could change the color or whatever, you could digitally enhance the shape of the building. Mm -hmm. That's very neat. How many, what's like the program then, how many people would be in the structure, do you think? Um, the studio outline was requesting like 4,300 square, no, 43,000 square feet. Mm. So, yeah, I haven't figured out necessarily the occupants or things like that, but I'd like to have it divided into like a performance hall slash research and development recording space, and then a tourism services space for the cruise ships, and then like an exhibition art space for artists and things like that. Studios, yeah, studio projects are, or like artist studio projects are always so tough because how do you avoid just giving these like vacuous spaces, right? I feel, exactly. I feel like that is a common thing. But then at the same time, uh, like the, the Pompidou Center is like one of the most culturally significant buildings and it is a couple stacks of essentially warehouse space, mm -hmm. but is so critical. Yeah, that's tough though. Because yeah, Herb's pretty uh, excited about having you guys doing almost big projects, big buildings, sort of for the sake of it, in order to be able to deal with that as kind of future professionals, say. Hey? Yeah, no, there's uh, some pretty cool projects in the studio. One girl's doing uh, a library um, that kind of deals with both the music scene and the culture within Reykjavik. Also, Reykjavik's a hugely literate society, like 99% illiterate, or literate, sorry. Illiterate. No one reads. No <laughs> one reads. Everybody reads. Everybody <laughs> so reads. So the visual media center would, would work very well then, if no yeah, one reads. Yeah, that's why they need videos so bad. <laughs> yeah. They're just going to skip the whole reading. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just show pictures. Amazing picture books come out of that country. Yeah, that's totally. great. <laughs> uh, one person's dealing with building ships, another's dealing with taking them apart, <laughs> and then another is dealing with um, and those two project locations are built right next to each other, they so they build actually, a ship and then they just awesome. take it right apart. Yeah, well, oh yeah. <laughs> um, and then one is dealing with the financial crisis and dealing with some sort of economic uh, regulatory system. And for that country? Or for, for just... For that country, yeah. Okay. In and the building something out of it or not doing a building? Sorry? And then not doing a building? Oh no, there's, there's a building associated with it. Right. For sure. So it's, like it's located a, right next to City Hall. And it's a coping center. Kind of yeah. This is how you cope with Wayne Broke. <laughs> Good, yeah. yeah. Just a big padded room. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. yeah, I think though it, it's, uh, it's good that he's so serious about, um, about that. Uh, working on doing buildings that big as opposed to kind of focusing on maybe the whole other process and like maybe someone gets to a big building but then they don't actually learn how to talk about the systems in order mm -hmm. to carry something out. Yeah, he's pretty critical. Because then he's talking to a lot of you guys have heard about then like office work in the future and then being capable to come out of school and work at an office that does buildings like that. Yeah, I mean, Ideally. it makes sense to be attempting these large scale buildings and just getting into the technology of it. Like, Cause one thing I always I hated about school is that it's, like I enjoy like the feel good drawings, but at the same time it's like, Okay, like I want to know how to put something together, mm -hmm. or not necessarily how to put something together, but now how that knowledge base and how you challenge that to kind of like, I think that's kind of a, so yeah. you're so he's pushing that your projects will actually go up to construction drawings themselves. Oh yeah, they have to. That's really good. Yeah. Do you find that that was different from when you got your undergrad two or three years ago? I mean, undergrad's undergrad. You can kind of do whatever you want at whatever pace you want, and you're ready to rock. Like, right. It's just kind of that base knowledge that you need, understanding what architecture is, and then how do you then apply that to a physical form, right? Mm -hmm. then, I guess the ability to take that the next step and actually understand how it connects and what details you can kind of drive from certain things is also really important. So you're focusing more for when your projects are nearing the end, more on the details of how stuff goes together or more of how to push a material itself? Um, kind of both. Like last term, I was focusing on digital meat, uh, digital fabrication, and the building skin, and so I'd like to kind of carry that into this term as well. So that that is talking about potentials and materiality and uh, connection potentials as well. So 
Um, I always focus on details. I, I start with details first before I start with a floor plan. Like, hmm. It just makes sense to me to start thinking about those connections first. So you're able to create a, like almost a language that's carried throughout the building? Yeah, like something small and simple but that can be replicated throughout the building or something like that. That was like that example you brought up when we were in Chicago about the uh, the museum extension where you had the, the drywall just off the oh, piano. Yeah. floor. Yeah, where the, uh, uh, there's no baseboard necessarily, it's just floating. Yeah, it looks like the wall's floating with the, like, it's like a two inch back set. Yeah. So it had like the dark shadow of where does the wall sit. Yeah, just, I mean, yeah, you can see that it's just kind of this wall that's floating above the ground. It, it just gives that kind of... Have you seen that? Yeah, I, well, I've been there. I know the type of detail you're talking about, and I've been in that building. I don't mm. remember it specifically in that building, but Renzo Piano is obviously pretty crazy with detailing. Mm -hmm. That's sweet. Do you find it was coming back to do your master's, because you worked for two years? Yeah. Do you find that it is easier, or do you have a different perspective? Like, how would it be compared to someone that just went straight through? Do you find that you're more knowledge-based, or...? I mean... I, I wouldn't say I necessarily have more knowledge base, but I just maybe have more of an idea of what what to do afterwards. Maybe I don't I don't know. Like, yeah, I'm learning in in the workforce, like how how projects actually go down, and you know how what we're doing here is very different from what is in the world and the real world, and I, that's totally fine. Like that's why I like coming back here and just yeah. doing whatever I want. But I wouldn't say that. I necessarily learned too much more than other people. Like maybe I have a better understanding of what's going to happen in the real world, but I don't know. Do you find it's hard to get back into the creative, more like the abstract work of studio? Because um, you want to, because you want to like get more just to the realization of the project itself. I think maybe. I mean, it's it's fun being back in terms of just doing whatever you want. Right, like at work, you're you're designing a box store or something like that in your first year or something. So it's not, not, it's not necessarily uh, super creative, but I don't know, I think getting back to the details of it is important just because then you're starting to understand or get out of your education more in terms of these details, whereas if you're just at work, you're kind of using details that are tried and true, mm -hmm. or at least the work I was doing for a while. It was just kind of a, a repetitive nature. Copy. Yeah. Paste. So, I mean, it's nice to come back and be kind of creative and go off the rails and think of something crazy and do it. And obviously, it would cost millions of dollars and never actually get built, but, I mean, like, it's kind of that joy of doing it. Mm -hmm. I have a few, not to speak of the office specifically, but I have a few op friends working in similar or same office as that. And so when, I've always kind of wondered about when talking about the copy and paste process, so like literally taking from other working drawings, mm -hmm. the, because the same details are going to get used, and then you just sort of, okay, the plan is a little bit different, and you call out the same detail. Yeah. And then, okay. I mean, in those situations, um, like the work that I did was a repetitive client, so it's a box store that obviously is built over and over again. Right. Things change here and there. Um, the size of the box. Yeah, the yeah. size of the box. I mean, <laughs> there are details that you'll take, and it's like, well, that doesn't apply here. Right. We have to do, um, we have to do a, a beam instead of uh, just a suspended wall. Like, sure. There, there's there's ways of m manipulating it, but really, it could be done kind of quickly, unless of course, like those are renovations that I would do. Whereas the new builds, that's like ground up and that was cool like yeah, yeah learning how the building goes box. together yeah but i like yeah maybe a big box store but it's it's still a complete built project like did you find the projects were changing with morphing building codes where you'd start to integrate better ways of doing something with the big box stores yeah no not really just static they they know what they're doing they do it over and over again and that's their system that's it yeah <laughs> It's weeded out pretty changes, quickly. Yeah. yeah, if something changes, it's like, ah, oh, shit. Okay, fine, put that in. Right. And then move on. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that, that's a completely different firm. That's like a production. Oh, for sure. Firm. That's what we get done. Because then you, you did move over to another, a different, totally different field almost in just doing competitions. 
Yeah, I uh, shifted over to another firm, and it was it was highly unique. They were just hired hired me to do competitions all summer, design competitions. But you almost made like your own position specifically to do that. Yeah, basically. <laughs> that's amazing. You just you just put it out there that that's what you wanted to do. And no, just... it just it just happened that um, in the portfolio that I used to submit to the other right. when I was looking for other work, and um, it just so happened that. The firm was looking to do some sort of initiative that engaged the office in design competitions and like get that conversation back in the office. Um, yeah, it just so happened they were wanting to do that. So based on the work that I did previously. It was almost perfect timing because that was right before you came back to do your master's and it was kind of prepped to getting back into the abstract thinking for Yeah, that and like timelines and things like that. Like obviously competitions are, can be pretty intense. Mm -hmm. So trying to organize the office to get involved in it and then make a submission, send it off to competitions. What was the timeline for comp like a competition? Because mostly when you do it on your own, you do it through studio, you have a month or two to do it. Was it much um, more production-based competition? Not necessarily. Like the first one, just because of the timing, it was a week away. Right. But you have to remember, like I was doing this full time. So yeah. if there's two people doing this kind of position full time, obviously you're going to produce a lot. So we did one in a week, and then I think we had another one two weeks after that. We ran an inter-office one, just to kind of get more involvement on the next one. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we took a bigger initiative, and um, uh, we knew about this one project that was in the works, but they weren't calling for anything yet. And so what we decided to do is jump the gun and do all the light work and make a proposal right. just to kind of say, Hey, look, we know you're interested in doing something here. How about this? And so that's actually what I'm going to go talk about on Saturday yeah. um, with, with the client and say, here's the idea. Because it took from then until now to <laughs> actually get together. But that's okay. Who cares? Presentations are a good experience. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to see uh, what the kind of conversation comes out of it. Right on. Did you, because um, I know we, we were bringing up the uh, river competition that the city had here, like 2050. Mm -hmm. That was a cool project. We I went and saw that. It was it was nice to see that the involvement of the community and whatnot between architects and land developers or mm -hmm. real estate developers and in your project itself. Did you feel that it was a good take from what you presented to the city? Was it did like the discussion afterwards? Yeah, yeah. I think like. It's kind of, I mean, it, the, the project that I submitted was a little bit more uh, one-way transit specific. Yeah. But I mean, again, yeah, it's connected to the city. Um, no, I think there was a good conversation about it. They discussed how, you know, how could this be implemented, you know, never thinking of the rivers as an actual transportation line. Um, so where it goes, I mean, I have no idea. It's just kind of an idea is generating competition so it's nothing too groundbreaking but um, come on you had like floating buses where yeah. you had you had the uh it was like a, a bus snowmobile <laughs> or turned from a boat to a yeah that reminds me fun. i was just reading this article this morning actually about uh they're testing self-driving buses in china recently or i think that the article is pretty recent but uh it's pretty sweet but then within the same article though they're also talking about some of the the concerns mm -hmm. of AI, and they showed this video that got released by a bunch of uh, Volvo researchers about a guy kind of sh like showing his trust in the software that he just wrote to stand in front of a car. I've seen oh, this. Going yeah. to it. Have you seen that? Yeah. Oh man, that was the first time I've seen that. Nailed. Yeah, he yeah. just gets like, hammered by this car. But uh, no, it was fascinating though. Uh, yeah, anyway, I don't know. Self driving buses. That's what I was thinking. Just There was a couple articles, I think it was on. Uh, tech website and I was talking about all the jobs that are going to be replaced in the next 40 years mm. with AI. Yeah. Even when you go onto a bus, like you have the driver and then there's the shielding and then the shielding gets bigger every year and eventually the shielding become more and more tinted and it just won't be a person there and it'll just yeah. be a black box. <laughs> You'll never know. It'll, it'll be such a switch. It'll, it'll be eventually such there's no door handle. Like, what? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, really tinted. It's, oh, well, there, mm -hmm. was, there was sun complaints. And, like, some people can't wear sunglasses, so we just tinted that section really dark on the bus. Yeah, just that's funny. AI. Huh. 
I think like within the same article then, and speaking of the, the moving of jobs, uh, where they're saying, I guess part of the discussion is that if the concern is that the robots can only do robot, robotic tasks, mm. you should point out that really we have historically used humans for pretty robotic tasks for a pretty long time. And a pretty huge amount of our jobs are in fact robotic and the jobs that only we can do are sometimes kind of not necessarily, or like something's less significant than we would think where a robot can't bust tables, but we have computers that offer law services and accounting services, mm -hmm. which is, is interesting. Like the types of jobs that will actually end up uh, getting taken care of are, it's, it is pretty substantial. And so then what, what does that leave in terms of how else, how do we prepare for work now? Or how do you, how do you educate? Because we're still educating in like a 19th century school system. Yeah. You know, for a very different, uh, for an industrial factory system mm -hmm. is essentially why it was set up in that way. So now, like, how do you how do you teach kids in just an entirely different makeup when there's just it's just so irrelevant, you know? Compared to what they're going to be graduating in, like, if you, exactly if you're mm -hmm. in grade two or three and graduating in grade twelve. The work you're being, yeah, exactly your point, the work you're being trained for is going to be so much more different. Yeah. The job market will be so changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Way. And I think uh, one of the things, and I think it's kind of been talked about for a long time, I've always, I've always been really interested in education, is just that uh, uh, it's pretty obvious now that there's no really worth in having an education driven to just accumulate information mm -hmm. rather than knowledge. Just to say, like, how can you consume this information rather than how can you like learn skills um, in terms of working in team types of skills or working with certain tools kinds of skills and uh, it's sort of a tough balance so there's this one I think I might talk about this in one of the last podcasts we did but there's this pretty cool school called High Tech High in San Francisco and everything that they do essentially feels like yeah, it feels like architecture school mm -hmm. it feels like ED2 where it being project based rather than uh, traditional grading like learning model and uh, um, basically like uh, yeah they just they have these kids rather than learn about physics from a textbook they have them one of the projects was that they they had the kids choose any civilization and understand why the civilization eventually failed and then understand the laws of physics in order to build like a physical model that kind of like moves like a Ruth, Ruth Goldberg machine yeah. and then collapses in the same way that their civilization that they studied failed. And that's, so they like, that's and, and it's like a, I think a term long project and then they learn physics and Everything. Uh, physics and then that sort of history and like although they may not have covered maybe all of the other civilizations or something or maybe they didn't cover all of the other um, uh, all of the other physics topics, but one of the points that they make is that it's not necessarily like absolute that uh, more content is better than a deeper understanding of the content mm -hmm. because they look at say okay then the AP history um, yeah the AP history American history thing they go through the entire course of the American of U USA which is 500 years sure. um, in a term, and so that means that you're only going to talk about the Civil War for three days, <laughs> or something, you yeah. know. And so then, like, okay, like obviously you're not going to understand that. Apparently, the classes have to move so quickly that the kids aren't even allowed to ask questions because they're just taking notes the whole time. It's just the way that the, like the AP you need a general works. understanding of history, and that's good enough. Because you need to write the test. We need to pack this information in so that you can write the test at the end, and it's it's like that. Test based. Yeah, that's what I actually enjoyed about going through U of M is there's no like especially when you get into the science school there's no test base it's more about your the ability to convey information itself yeah through showing your diagrammatic your mm -hmm. process it's more about the process than it is about the final thing like doesn't I mean you want to have your final building with details but it's more about the process of how you were able to get from point A like just a field to a field that has a complex that hardly looks like it's there yeah. or it, it brings the social realm into this space to better this area. Yeah, I hated my first degree. It's just all the test space. It's Before you got into. Oh, yeah. oh it's the worst. Yeah. Mm. I. Where did you? Where are you from, Winnipeg? Yeah. yeah. Where, what high school did you go to? Uh, Kildare East. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I found uh, 
especially if you don't get in when you start your undergrad into design school. It hampers you so much because then your, your credit hours are just compounding, compounding, compounding. Oh, yeah. And if you don't get in within your first year, you're, instead of just applying with 30 credits, you have the 60 and then you have 90. Right. So trying to, like, say if you got a bad grade or something, to fix that right. to get to the minimum again for this design right. school. And after a certain point, I think they only take the, the top last 60. 90 or top 60. 60 or yeah. Like that. That's the only reason I got in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's the same with me. I was like, ooh, okay. So then I waited another year and got rid of some mistakes. Yep. And then you get in. But once you're in, it's, it's so refreshing that, A, you have a desk space to just sit at and think, I mean, that's hmm. a rarity in itself, but then you have no more tests. It's more of this, just do, do your idea and teach you how to use technology and how to use the actual methods of portraying and documenting. I think that's the biggest thing we learn at this school. It's like the documentation of your work. Mm -hmm. And it's very, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, do you think that as design students that you would have really benefited and just had an entirely different experience than in secondary or like were you frustrated throughout secondary like like high school no. in terms of like learning models i think it was in a way that yeah exactly that you're so conformed like you must do this in this specific way you when it came to like math or science it's so process-based that there's only one way of getting mm -hmm. to this answer or whatever it is whereas design you can just come from multiple angles, as long as you kind of curve back and land in that scope circle. Well, design, well, I feel like in design, it doesn't really matter if you did that. It's okay if you just like, and then as long as that was interesting. Justify it. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> as long as it's like the, the whole course, like actually, in fact, like, it's almost like don't end up there. It's mm -hmm. almost like the, the opposite. Um, yeah, because I find that, especially, yeah, often a lot of the design students may be someone that couldn't have necessarily sat still. Or I feel like saying then math for you, as you're saying, how would you have um, performed differently if it was like a, a business model of math rather than or like an entrepreneurial model as someone that's interested in business? Right. I think young, young Bryce would have been all over that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd hope so. Yeah, I mean, it'd be, it'd be, you'd have, I guess it'd be more direct reaction to your actions than it was just, uh, okay, do this, do this. And I think it might have been even going back to your American history example there where it's like, you have to learn this process in here, this process in here, and how do you, well, what about this and this? And it's like, well, that's not in the, it doesn't worry about that. Right. Whereas if you're more free of going towards a business model, it'd be more, okay, if I do this, it makes it easier to do this and this, mm -hmm. and it comes back and you can, you know, you build on something. Right. Whereas it's more like the regurgitation of information and whatnot and just, I don't know. I mean, like, high school is just kind of a building block thing, right? Whereas, I think coming into university for your first years, that's where it should be, like, the design studio kind of mentality, where it's, how do you get to this point, and how do you kind of it educate would make, yourself? It like, would be, it'd make more sense, too, because, I mean, obviously, the university is a business. You have to be able to credit the money spent to credits earned. But people being educated in a university, if they go and work for a, a new age company, that's what that company is based off of. It's design community. I mean, a lot of corporations don't even have desks anymore. They have sharing spaces or they have, you can just rent this chair for the day. The workspace is always changing, therefore your environment's always changing, keeping your mind fresh. It's like, it's the same logic as taking a different way home every day. Mm -hmm. It prevents your mind from going on autopilot, so you're always thinking. A lot of these businesses that are run like that, more, more or less tech companies, like you're going to be sitting on a computer all day coding or whatever you're doing on a computer, you can take your workspace wherever you want to go and chaining you to a desk isn't really the answer in most of these companies. And it enables, from what I've read, it enables more different uh, areas of a business to interact and co-mingle because it's no longer third floor is this, fourth floor is this. It's, they're just open spaces with areas to work and you have people with different um, backgrounds working together on a group project and they just find a table or they find a couch to work on. Hmm. It's kind of like how this school is but studio based just remove all the walls that appeared three or four years ago. <laughs> just all open. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't mind. We got a lot of room. <laughs> <laughs>
great. Well, your studio is nice and small. You only have five people. I mean, what what are the, what's the biggest studio this year? Here, eighteen. Eduardo's pretty packed. Yeah. I'm not sure how he's doing. He has. And then yeah, Leanne had twelve, I think, right. reviews. That's a lot. This reminds me of the old um, five four six studio when they first started teaching here. It was like five or six people. Oh really? Yeah, sure. massive space. Do you remember that one? Uh, mm -hmm. Stas was in that one. Yeah. Yeah, that was a uh, huge space. No people. Hmm. This kid. Like and then you guys moved though, didn't you? Weren't you downtown at one point? That was the next year after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the year after, yeah, we were downtown. We tried that urban studio setup. I thought that was very interesting. So we moved from U of M to downtown Winnipeg. And then being in that situation, we were able to, because 546 was teaching it at that time, we were able to go to their office and ask, just ask them questions instead of the architect or the instructor coming to like talk to us like they'd come in like one or two days a week but if you had a question you just walk down the street mm -hmm. I think that was, it was a good conversation of at the time there of why it's located on the south end of Winnipeg and the architecture school theoretically should be placed downtown for that specific reason where all the offices are well I think you might have better integration through reviews processes instead of trying to get people to come because most of the offices in Winnipeg are downtown Mm -hmm. for the most part. But if you had the school downtown, I think there'd be a better integration of professional world. Yeah, like recently they had um, uh, the discussion with our offices bringing thesis students out and present their ideas to the office. Mm -hmm. Not as like a, um, like a super formal kind of way, but more of a discussion of like, hey, what are you guys doing? Like, it, it was a discussion that it was hard for people downtown to come down so for say uh, a noon lecture or something, you yeah. Know, by the time they get down here and yeah. get back, it's no two lunch and two hours later, right? Yeah. Like, so the idea of bringing students to these offices and offices hosting it as like an open event for other people to come from the other offices and just see uh, thesis students present their work. Hmm. Who's, who's having that discussion? Um, it was number ten having uh, they had one student come on already. And then I think a couple of other firms are also thinking about hosting it as well. Hmm. So I think that's, that's genius because the divide between the undergrad and graduate level when you are done school between the professional world is so, unless you ran into them or introduced to that person during an, like a, a talk here or whatnot, there's no really interaction with these people. No, I'd say it's, it's more of a self-driven yeah. kind of thing. Like if you were working, say, in between yeah, and you're gonna meet more people then. I have the discussions then, but like, yeah, it, it's it's not an openly accessible kind of conversation between um, practice and school. I definitely think the uh, the thesis presentations should be a more of a public venue, especially being downtown. That'd be such an interesting concept if you had thesis students setting up. I mean, it might take three or four days to accomplish thesis presentations, yeah. but if you had them set up in different offices as different venues to go for almost like an urban tour of offices, but also the thesis, that'd be such a neat concept. It'd be mm -hmm. almost like a guided tour of education. And yeah. you'd have, again, it's like connecting offices, it's connecting students, it's just making a better network of the design community or the maker community itself. It's like the, the idea I was telling you about uh, a couple of years back, Thesi Week. Remember oh, that? Yeah where this concept was to bring all the thesis projects from the U of M and put them into the main area of the WAG, hmm. so like the Winnipeg Art Gallery, and then therefore the venue is more accessible for people working downtown. Hmm. You just call it Thesi Week. Hmm. And then at that point, you're presenting in a public forum, so you have to defend it educationally and publicly. Mm -hmm. So you have the more simplistic questions of what the hell are you doing? And you yeah. also have to defend it through an education or academic basis. But maybe even if they're separate, like, because if you're going to get, like, the public questioning these things, right, like, it's a, your present, your presentation style would be completely different yeah. if you were talking to a crit versus a, mm -hmm. someone who didn't know what you were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, if you speak in layman's terms. Yeah. With, yeah. Well, the, the public. Yeah. And it's not so much just, like, dumbing it down, but just making it, more accessible in terms of why you came to that conclusion or why you're even doing a project 
at this place at this location in that kind of program? So if the presentation would struggle, maybe the presentation is left at an academic level. I mean, anyone can come and view it, but then there's like the specific, obviously you have your external, your internal, and your crit that are gonna be more or less talking to you. But then even just to leave the yeah. projects there for, there for a week, to just to come by and walk, that'd be so nice to see. The public can come and watch it or come view it and see what's going on and see where, you know, potentially where architecture in the city is gonna go yeah. with where the school's going. But even just enabling maybe even future employers just to go and look at the field itself and be like, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like that's kind of like the year-end exhibition, right? Like, yeah. Where people couldn't come and just see it, but making it more accessible to just the general public. Because yeah. like, not a lot of people know about our year-end exhibitions here. So. It's also a hike and there's no parking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no, yeah, that'd be interesting. Don't tell does Herb have anything planned for your guys' reviews or bringing someone significant or? Um, not that he's mentioned, um, but from day one he's been thinking about your end, about how he wants to <laughs> change the space. In That's this funny. area here? Yes, yeah. location, like how he wants to present our two projects. Because we had the first semester, now the second semester. Yeah, not. So he's always talking about like, you guys should make one big model. Like, where's the big model? Make an island. <laughs> make the harbor. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, that's what we'll be doing. Are all your sites within the same vicinity? Um, yeah, the, there's four of us along the harbor, and then one that's back, set back a little bit. But we'll just make it in separate pieces and kind of put them all together. So that's cool. That'll be a nice display. Yeah. Bring some snow in from outside. Yeah. Can I keep Chilling. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? I don't care. Dead air is not my problem. It's just whatever, man. It's a conversation. Um, kind of covered everything. I don't know. What else are you working on? Anything else? Nope. Uh, just studio, wrapping up some topics week, uh, tech deadlines next week, and then. Some stuff for work that I have to get done this week as well. Right on. Reading week is every yeah. break. So. Well, I think you're the only person here in studio, though. Oh well, well, that's the thing. Like one person <laughs> is working, one person went back home. The other two are probably working at home. Right. Like smart people. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the? Is Mike's working? Um, he's probably working at home. Oh, I see. Yeah. Hmm. But otherwise, yeah, Brad's not works full time. Not full time, but almost full time in the reading week. That's intense. Yeah. Who is? Resna. Hmm. Like ever an office or Dick serving or something? Yeah, she works uh, uh, in uh, Osborne. Hmm. Right on, man. There we go. Okay, well, I think that's. Uh, cool to wrap it up. Yeah. That's it. Mm hmm. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Talk to you again. If you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs>